Hello and welcome to The Understudy, the channel that teaches you everything about musical theatre. My name is Philippa and today I will read from the Broadway Musicals, The 101 Greatest Shows of All Time by Ken Bloom and Frank Blasnick. To get the full version of the book, I recommend getting the physical copy as images and certain inserts from the book won't be displayed here. I do not own this material, I'm just reading from a place of entertainment and education. And I will not edit these audio recordings as I go so you will get the unabridged version. Today um, I will read section D. Damn Yankees opened on May 5th in 1955 at the 46th Street Theatre with 1,019 performances. Produced by Frederick Brisson, Robert E. Griffith and Harold S. Prince. Music and lyrics by Richard Audler and Jerry Ross. Book by George Abbott and Douglas Wallop, Wallop <laughs> from the novel The Year of the Yankees Lost the Pennant by Douglas Wallop. Musical director Hal Hastings. Music orchestrated by Don Walker. Dance arrangements by Rogers Adams. Music by George Abbott. Dances and musical numbers staged by Bob Fosse. Scenic and costume design by William and Jean Eckert. Synopsis. The false legend is played out on the fields of baseball. Joe Boyd, a typical suburban middle-aged fan, sells his soul to the devilish Mr. Applegate in order to help his beloved Washington Senators with the, win the pennant. Transformed into the strapping Joe Hardy, he improves the Senators' record, reaching the final game of the season against those damn Yankees. Joe grows homesick for his wife, Meg, discovers an escape clause in his contract and attempts to break the agreement. So, Mr. Applegate sends the seductress Lola to convince Joe to honor his contract. In the end, Joe returns to Meg. Cast Lola, Gwen Verdon, Applegate, Ray Walston, Joe Hardy, Stephen Douglas, Joe Boyd, Robert Schaefer, Gloria Thorpe, Ray Allen, Meg Boyd, Shannon Bolin, Van Buren, Russ Brown, Smokey, Nathan Nathaniel Frey, Sister, Jean Appleton. Proving wrong those who said baseball and theater couldn't mix, Damn Yankees was the third and last of Richard Aldler, Adler, Jerry Ross collaborations. It turned out to be a re to be a reunion of the most of the team of the Pajama Game. Helmer, George Abbott, danceman Bob Fosse, producers Brisson, Prince, and Griffin, Griffith, and the music department of Don Waker. Walker and Hal Hastings. The cast was new, of course. The pajama game had opened only a year before, and the gang down at the St. James was still going strong. Even so, couldn't most of the pajama game crew have played in, well, well, in damn Yankees? Eddie Foy as Applegate, John Raid as Joe, Carol Haney as Lola, Janice Page as third base. The creative team worked exceedingly smoothly smoothly and out of town, only two major changes occurred. First, the response to Gwen Verdon in her first starring role was so strong. Adler and Ross quickly wrote A Little Brains, A Little Talent, so Lola could enter the action earlier in the act. Second, there was the matter of the baseball ballet. This was Fosse's major choreography choreographic set piece, his version of Jerome Robbins' Keystone Cop Ballet from High Button Shoes. Complete with a game of musical chairs, multiple entrances and exits, and an absurdist gorilla. The ballet was cut, much to Fosse's unhappiness, but after he had worked and reworked after he had worked and reworked it countless times. It was perfectly grand in mid 1950s Broadway musical comedy romp with a solid book, quick pacing and tuneful score. Above all though, it was absolutely seminal that the first pairing of the greatest marriages both on stage and off in Broadway history. Although it opened as George Abbott as a George Abbott show, Damn Yankees has become known in the intervening years as a Fosse Verdant show. In other hands, the comic seduction, whatever Lola wants, could have been viewed as load. Lewd. Um, but with Verdon's unparalleled ability to kid her sexuality, along with Fosse's witty, quirky staging, it became the showstopper that the sometimes prudish matinee blues hair, blue hairs screamed for the loudest. Outside of Fosse's dancers, there was much else to admire, including the performances of 
Abbott regulars Nat Frey, Ray Allen, and Jean Stapleton, the understated vaudeville and de devil of Ray Walton, truly the unsung hero of the show. For Walton uh, seeped in around the edges and insinuated her himself to the center stage. And its touching love story, really a triangle, among Shannon Bolin and the two Joes, a young and old Stephen Douglas and Robert Schaefer. Damn Yankees was also faithfully filmed, with the Broadway cast mostly intact, again, much like the pajama game, with one movie star substitu substituted for a principal. This time, it was Top Hunter, Tab Hunter as the Doris Ray Ringer. A bizarre 1967 television version with Lee Remick and Phil Silvers was more acid trip than Broadway musical. And the 1994 Broadway revival was dead from inception, suffering the tragic casting of Bebe Newworth as Lola. Uh, Newworth, an extremely talented triple threat performer, lacked the one thing that many Lola must possess first and foremost, charm. As the publicity-hungry Velma Kelly, or Jada Nikki in Sweet Charity, she was right on the money, hard, slick, and deadpan. As Lola, Newworth was adrift in the platinum blonde wig. One final thing. When the, first, when the show first opened, the logo featured Gwen Verdon in a baseball uniform, coyly looking over her shoulder. It was decided to lead with their strongest suit, so the perform producers revamped the look, even reissuing the cast album with a new photo. To sport Vendum Verdon clad in her striptease tights against the devilish red background, it made all the difference in the world. Putting emphasis on the dam instead of Yankees, one wonders if Bob Fosse recalled this important marketing lesson 20 years later when Pippin opened to extremely mixed review reviews. Uh, the television he directed, the television ad he directed, not only saved the show but opened a whole new frontier in Broadway promotion. Bob Fosse. Bob Fosse grew up wanting to be the next Fred Astaire. Luckily for the Broadway musical, he was too short, balding, and frankly, his reputation as a great ladies' man notwithstanding, not a highly masculine presence which, by the time of his arrival in Hollywood, had become the rigueur in, broad in musical stars. Choreographing his first Broadway show, The Pajama Game, Fosse began to develop his singular vocabulary, and his second. Damn Yankees, he found, in Gwen Verdon, a muse for his idiosyncratic style with a body perfectly suited to his knock-kneed precision. With a string of successes, Bells Are Ringing, New Girl in Town, and Redhead, the latter two starring Verdon, by then his third wife, Fosse became heir apparent to the mantle of Jerome Robbins. Gwen Verdon, Gwen Verdon uh, took time off to have a baby, Fosse steamed along, re-choreographing how to succeed, and, and, re and devising the hilarious dances for Little Me. After sweet, sweet Charity, he branched out into film, and in 1972, everything he touched turned to gold. The television special Liza with a Z, Emmy, the movie version of Cabaret, Oscar, and the real magic art act, Pippin, Tony which he made into more than a, its meddling material exhibited on the page. His next Broadway show, Chicago, which nearly killed him from, having, from a heart attack, was a brilliant example of Fosse's ability to draw from all traditions, in this case of vaudeville and burlesque salad days. More, than a, dan more a dance concert than musical, dancing was a marathon of a show for the cream of the crop of Broadway dancers of the 1970s. Away from the theater of early eight years, Fosse returned with Big Deal. His last show was not a success. While attending to the Washington, D.C. opening of the national tour of his successful 1986 Broadway revival of Sweet Charity, Fosse collapsed and died. Uh, his alter ego of over 30 years, Gwen Verdon, at his side. Backstage. The day after the opening, Prince, Griffith, and Abbott called a rehearsal. They cut one number, switched another from the second act to the first, cut 20 minutes from the script, and rewrote the ending. The changes went in that evening. Walter Kerr even came, came back to re-review the, re the show. The role of Lola was originally offered to Marilyn Monroe, Ziza Jamer, and Missy Geyer. Gwen Verdon, nicknamed Boots for the orthopedic shoes she wore to correct crickets, 
Gwen Verdon, Broadway's greatest dancing star ever, was raised down the street from MGM, where her father worked. After seeing work in nightclubs to support her son, she became a protege of choreographer Jack Cole, assisting him on several Broadway shows and many movies in the 20th Century Fox, where she taught Marilyn Monroe to dance. As the lead dancer in Can Can, she saw her role whittled down to a little more than an ensemble part, primarily though the through the mechan machinations of the threatened star Lilo. Verdon's talent shone through, and though, and she became a star when, on opening night, she was dragged on stage from a dressing room, clad only in a towel, the, auntian, the audience chanting, We want Verdon! Another lucky break occurred when she was cast as a sexy temptress Lola in Damn Yankees, her first show with future husband Bob Fosse. She became a superstar, and her photo in striptease tights, one of the most iconic Broadway images ever, in four more Broadway shows, all of which, all with Fosse, Verdon, all with Fosse, Verdon owned Broadway. New Girl in Town, where she proved herself as a very fine dramatic actress. The murder mystery musical Redhead, where she won her fourth Tony Award in seven years. Sweet Charity, where she, where her over-the-shoulder stance became as famous as Damn Yankees' Lola pose. Her swan song as the greatest Roxy Hart ever in Chicago. While continuing to act in such films as Cocoon and Marvin's Room, she was just as happy behind the scenes as dance captain of Fosse's Dancing and coach to Deli Debbie Allen in the revival of Charity. With a better singing voice than she was given credit for, boundless, boundless comedic gifts and a uh, who-me quality as much satire as sex, Gwen Verdon appealed equally to men and women, gay and straight, young and old, she is truly missed. Great scores from So So Shows, part one. We've all been fooled in the past. You can buy a CD or an LP for the truly ancient, give it a listen and think, how could this show have failed? It's happened time and time again. In fact, producers have are often bamboozled into investing shows, thinking that just because a score is great, the show must be too. Wrong, wrong, wrong. For all too often, a wonderful score is surrounded by a less than wonderful show. The greatest example of a great score from a flop show is Candide, which, despite its recent successes, definitely did not set the world ablaze in its original production. Harold Arlen hit the great score so-so show trifecta with House of Flowers, Jamaica. It ran, but only because of Lena Horne and St. Louis Woman. Almost matching Arlen's record for great songs from OK shows is Jerry Herman. He followed the smash hit Mame with Dear World, featuring the same star and much of the same team, and another wonderful, if different flavored score. Herman hit a home run with Gower Champion on Hello Dolly, but he and Champion struck out with Mac and Mabel. The excellence of Herman's score is breathtaking and also heartrending, considering how poorly the show was initially reviewed, received. Stephen Sondheim's score from Merrily We Run Along was thrilling, augmented by Jonathan Tunick's incredible brassy orchestrations. But the show, as seen at the Alvin, no. Arthur Siegel, a com wonderful composer, he wrote the music to Love is a Simple Thing from New Faces in 1952, a sweet man, and the person who knew more about show music than anyone, always insisted that Jerome Kurt and Otto Harbach's Roberta, with a stunning set of songs, was the big crashing bore in performance. Ultimately, we are damn lucky that the beautiful songs are what survive from these less than stellar show creations. Great shows, or so we tell ourselves. The Desert Song opened November 30th in 1926 at the Casino Theatre with 471 performances. Produced by Lawrence Schwab and Frank Mandel. Music by Sigmund Romberg. Lyrics by Otto Harbeck and Oscar Hammerstein II. Rob book by Otto Harbeck, Oscar Hammerstein, and Frank Mandel. Orchestra under the direction of Oscar Bradley. Book directed by Arthur Hurley. Musical numbers staged by Robert Connolly. Scenic design by Woodman Thompson. Modern costume design by Vivian, Vivian Donner. Costume design by Mark Moore. Synopsis. 
The Red Shadow, leader of a rebel band known as the Riffs, kidnaps Margot Bonvalet, a commonly French woman. In a twist reminiscent of the Scarlet Pimpernel and Naughty Marietta, the true identity of Red Shadow is Pierre, the supposedly milk toast son of the governor of Morocco, General Burabo. Where the rebel band is tracked down, the Red Shadow himself finds Red Shadow finds himself in the uninevitable position of having to duel his own father. Pierre backs down, much to the derision of his not so merry band. General Birabo's aside, uh, General Birabo aide, Captain for Paul Fontaine, is determined to bring the Red Shadow to justice until the jealous. Arab girl, Azuri, reveals the true identity of the mystery man to him. Fontaine does n the only decent thing, showing the general the burn news of the Red Shadow and declaring the interloper vanquished, thus keeping secret forever the identity of the general's offspring and making the safe and making safe the presumed marriage of Margot and Pierre. Cast Sid Elkar, William O'Neill, Benjamin Kidd, Eddie Bustle. Captain Paul Fontaine, Glendale, Azuri, Pearl Gay, Margaret Bonvalet, Vivienne, Vivienne Segal, General Barabo, Edmund Belton, Pierre Barabo, Robert Halliday, Susan, Nellie Breen, Ali Ben Ali, Lyle Evans. Rudolf Valentino was mesmerizing women in his silent turns in The Sheik and Son of the Sheik. T. E. Lawrence was sending back almost daily reports through journalist Lowell Thomas. In French Morocco, an actual band of rebels called the Riffs was making things hotter for the French. All things ex so exotically Arabian were in vogue. And so what better time to present a Saharan opera, operetta? The true hero of the Desert Song isn't the Red Shadow, however. It is the composer Sigmund Romberg, whose masculine martial melodies propelled the action forward. Even the comic songs It and One Good Man Gone Wrong have certain incessant rhythmical underpinnings. The score's momentum and lusty vocal arrangements typify the operetta form. Riff songs in the vein in the vein of testosterone-driven marches like Nada Moretta, Tramp, 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 Rio Rita's March of the Rangers, and New Moon's Stout-Hearted Men. In the late 1920s, operetta coexisted peacefully with more modern musical comedies. The same month when The Desert Song opened, the Gershwin brothers, OK, received hussars from audiences. An English version of the French operetta Mozart opened at the Music Box Theatre the day before the Desert Song, and the original French version of Mozart opened at the 46th Street Theatre a little over a month later. Richard Rogers and Lawrence Hart's Peggy Ann, the first psych psychological serialistic musical, opened the same day as the revival of Mozart. Astoundingly, Rogers and Hart's next show, Betsy, opened the next day. At the 1920s, Wound down, wound down. However, the operettas were slowly supplanted by the musical comedy. A little over a year after the debut of the Desert Song, Showboat opened. On the surface, an operetta, but set in America, the Broadway musical would never ever be the same. Even with the brown, groundbreaking show changing the course of the musical, the greatest operettas live on to this day, with their stirring songs and romantic, though creaky, plots offering thrills and ha to audiences who are willing to leave their preconceptions in the lobby. True, these shows may have stilled the dialogue and lyrics by today's standards, and their plots might rely a little too much on coincidence, but the emotions are deeply felt and empathetically richer than those in today's musicals. In, th in addition, these shows don't stay with the confines of the corny stereotypes. They are loaded with modern notions, cynicism, and even self-deprecating humor. What they don't contain is irony, a singular attribute of today's modern musical. The, today the world of operetta is a tribute to the past, promoting a respect for audiences and an unabashed joy in the drama of kisses, sword fights, unrequited love, good versus evil, a good cry, and a good laugh. The Desert Song has all these elements, and it is still performed to enthusiastic audiences almost 80 years after its premiere. Backstage, sheet music of songs from the show that is 
that bear the original title, Lady Fair, are prized as holy grail to music collectors. In the style of the day, Oscar Hammerstein sloppily wrote the lyrics for the opening numbers, reasoning that audiences were coming in late, getting settled, and not really listening. When the when he heard the opening number of the Desert Song in London, however, the audience was on time, attentive, and listening to the every bad lyric clearly enunciated and projector. Hammerstein decided that he would never again be cavalier about an opening number. Vivienne Segal. The beautiful, talented Vivienne Segal was one of the three women who had the ability, taste, and intelligence to break out the operetta world and cross over to even greater fame in musical theater. When Jeanette MacDonald and Irene Dunn decamped to Hollywood, Segal made her career in Hollywood, remaining a great star of the Broadway theater, of the musical theater. She got her start on Broadway at 18, singing Sigmund Rombert's Off Widerstein Stein in 1915's The Blue Paradise, and her clear, round soprano and natural beauty caught critics and audiences' eyes and ears, after appearing in the legendary production of Miss 1917. Segal's natural, commanding stage presence was used in Jerome Curtin's early musical comedy's success, Oh Lady Lady. After co-starring with Vernon and Irene Kastler in Castles in the Air, she became a superstar in two of the greatest operettas, The Desert Song and Rudolf Fremel's The Three Musketeers in 1928. While on the West Coast, filming the early movie musical Viennese, Viennese Knights, she befriended Richard Rogers and Lawrence Hart and convinced them to turn to New York to return to New York in I Married an Angel. Uh, convinced her, who convinced her to return to New York in I Married an Angel. She followed that success with her greatest role, the glamorous, sophisticated Vera Simpson in the controversial and groundbreaking Pal Joey, introducing Bewitched, Bothered, and Bewildered. Lawrence Hart, one of her greatest admir admirers, wrote his last song, To Keep My Love Alive, for her appearance in the 1943 revival of A Connecticut Yankee. She retired from the stage after the immensely successful 1952 revival of Pal Joey. Do Re Mi opened December 26, at the nine, <laughs> opened tw December 26, 1960s, uh, at the James Theatre with 400 performances. Produced by David Merrick, book by uh, Garson Cannon, music by Jules Stein, lyrics by Buddy Camden and Adolf Green, musical director Lehman Engel, music orchestrated by Luther Henderson, vocal arrangements and vocal direction by Buster Davis, dance arrangements by David Baker, directed by Garson Cannon, choreographed by Mark's Bro Mark Brooks and D.E.D. Woods, scenic design by Boris Aronson. Costume design by Irene Sharaf. Lighting design by Al Eller. Synopsis. Pursuit of the American dream is the subject of Do Re Mi. Hubie Cram is a self-proclaimed dreamer and schemer who is always looking for that lucky break. His long-suffering wife, Kay, loves him but can't help wondering, what if? Hubie's latest schemes, scheme involves a bright new singer with the name Tilda Mullen. Hubie's surprisingly Success lead with her leads him into the juice box business and into trouble with the mob. If Hubie's father is Hubie's fate never to succeed and he doesn't, it's Hubie's fate never to succeed and he doesn't. But Tilda falls in love with record producer John Henry Wheeler and Kay and Hubie are happily married. Kay Cram, Nancy Walker, Hubert Cram, Phil Silvers, John Henry Wheeler, John Reardon. Fatso Arir, George Matthews, Skin Demopolis, George Givet, Brains Berman, David Burns, Tilda Mullen, Nancy Dussault. Jules Stein is hailed as a great tunesmith and a particularly theatrical composer. He also receives kudos for his ability to tailor his music to suit the talents of his stars, but he's not given enough credit for his offbeat songs. While Do Re Mi boasts a wonderful standard, Make Someone Happy, written in the traditional Broadway ballad form, songs such as Waiting, Waiting, Adventure, Take a Job, and All, my Li All of My Life are character-driven monologues, not merely attempts at a top, not merely attempts at a top chart topper. The steam, stream of consciousness, 
The stream of consciousness quality that he has explored with Rose's turn in Gypsy was utilized here as well, with C and D sections taking the songs in more and more unexpected directions. Even the bridges of these songs have bridges. Of course, these numbers were aided by the wonderfully interpreted talents of Nancy Walker and Phil Silvers, not your typical trained voices, with Nancy Dussault and Robert Reardon handling fireworks and the romantic ballads. It was up to Walker and S Silvers to traverse the tricky meter riff shifts and acting shores of these unusual songs, unlike any other number in any other musical. Do Re Mi is also one of those shows that deal with a particular New York Milo Milo, Milo, Milo? <laughs> we'll never see again. Though the producers takes place in and around Broadway, it has one. It has none of the feelings of Times Squares and Habitues, certain sons of Habitues, to quote Finian's Rainbow. In Guys and Dolls, we get to meet the Broadway gamblers, bookies, and betters, and the righteous who ha try to help them. Wonderful Town, another Betty Comden and Olive Green favorite, spends most of its time with its denizens of artistry, offbeat Greenwich Village, and their on the town shows the romantic goodness of World War II Manhattan, where the 24 hours can go so fast. Do Re Mi explores the nightclub record jukebox business. These days, with Times Square seeming more like a shopping mall food, Court, no longer a colorful character such as Guys and Dolls, Harry the Horse, General Matilda B. Cartwright, and Sky Madison inhabit the area. Or on the towns Lucy Schmiller and Maud P. Dilly, or Doremis, Fatso Orvier, Skin Demopolis, and Brains Berman. Phil Silvers. Inspired show, <laughs> inspired clown, Phil Silvers was completely as a town in the world of musical comedy with his rapid-fire delivery and energetic singing. His persona was most often a variation of the shifty salesman fast-talking his way in and out of trouble, which he developed in his early career in burlesque. After a debut in 1939 playing Punko Parks in Yokel Boy, he scored as conman Harrison Floyd in his first hit, High button shoes. Playing the monumental ego Jerry Biffle in Top Banana, he exemplified every tyrannical attitude attribute of the TV variety show Megastar, read Milton Berle. Driving the show to a frenzied pitch with his breathtaking, breathless double talk. Although he never let his Becoming a mask slipped too far, he showed a more dramatic side as lovable loser Hubie Cram in Doremi, revealing the true vulnerability with a Rose's turn esque 11 o'clock number, All of My Life. Turning down the lead in the original A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, he brilliantly played Pseudolus in Forum's 10th anniversary production at the Amazon in Los Angeles co-starring his old Doremi wife, Nancy Walker. It later transferred to Broadway, where its successful, was run, successful run was cut short by Silver's stroke. Nancy Dussault. The delightful ingenue news, Nancy Dussault lent her quirky charm to many musicals of the 1960s, confidently clowning alongside such pros as Phil Silver's and Nancy Walker in Doremi. She never faded into the scenery. Equally comfortable as a pure soprano or rangy high belter, her versatility was well captured on the Do Re Mi cast album. Mournful in Cry Like the Wind, catchy in What's New at the Zoo, and pure Jewel Stein bliss in Fireworks. Her duet with the sensational baritone Joe Reardon. After closing her orig the original Broadway run of The Sound of Music as Maria, she starred as anthropo anthropologist Emily Kernstein in the guilty pleasure Bajor, once again demonstrating her curious penchant for making animal noises in her songs. Her Cheren Lon McLonorgan in 1966 City Center revival of Finian's Rainbow was exceedingly well perceived. Well cast as a situation comedy wife, she spent much of the 1970s and 80s in California, returning to co-star with Hermione Jingle. Jingle. Uh, Larry Her Kurt and Georgia Brown in the second company of Side by Side by Sondheim. Her last Broadway appearances uh, to date was 
a replacement witch in Into the Woods. Still singing as effortlessly as ever, she waits along with Donna McKechnie, Anita Gillette, Pamela Myers, Susan Watson, and her great and greatest friend Karen Morrow to tackle one more great musical theater role. Backstage, President Kenny. Kennedy wanted to see Dory Me with only a few hours notice. There were no seats available anywhere but at the sin but because a synagogue had bought out the theater. When Jules Stein asked the woman if she would mind giving up her seat for the president elect, she replied that she would if the president asked her personally. Kennedy met her in the lobby, asked for the tickets, and she promptly fainted. Dream Girls opened November twentieth, nineteen eighty one, at the Imperial Theater with 1,521 performances. Produced by Michael Bennett, Bob Avian, Jeffen Records, and the Schubert Organization. Music by Henry, Shri Henry Krieger, book by Tom Ian and, and lyrics by Tom Ian. Music orchestrated by Harold Wheeler. Musical director, Jolanda Segovia. Vocal arrangements by Cleveland Lyrics. Directed by Michael Bennett. Choreographed by Michael Bennett. Co-choreographer, Michael Peters. Scenic design by Robin Wagner. Costume design by Theoni B. Aldridge. Lighting design by Theron Musser. Synopsis. What happens when a part is greater than the whole, especially in the black vocal group a la Supremes? The con dream consists of Dina, Laurel, and Effie. But it's Effie who creates the conflict. Though her talent is immense, so is she. Curtis Taylor, their agent and initially Effie's lover, finds them a gig as the opening act for a James Brownian soul singer. James thunder early, but as they rise up the Motown ladder, Curtis sees dollar signs in the beautiful, marketable Dina and moves her to the lead role on stage and in his affections. Soon, Effie finds herself not only out of Curtis's bed, but bed, but out of the group, replaced by the slimmer, prettier Michelle. After a comeback climb from the bottom, Effie finally gets a song on the charts. When Curtis tries to cover the song with the dreams, Effie, finally believing in herself, fights back and wins. The dreams break up while Effie's career is just taking off. Cast Marty, Bondi Curt Hall, Curtis Halls, Curtis Jailer Jr., Ben Harney. Dina Jones, Cheryl Rila Ralph, Laurel Robinson, Loretta Devine, Cece White, Abba Babatunde, Effie Melody White, Jennifer Holliday, James Thunder Early, Cleveland Derricks, Michelle Morris, Deborah Burrell. Nearly one quarter of the 101 shows in this book feature performers as central characters, from ballets on your toes to strip clubs, the Folly Monty, and from movies, City of Angels, Kiss of the Spider Woman, to Wild West shows, and Get Your Gun. Show business has proved a natural setting of, for exploring the themes of failure, success, and the pursuit of happiness. Nightclubs, Pal Joey, Guys and Dolls, Cabarets, Saloons, Death Street Rides Again, a three, Tree Grows in Brooklyn, and even musicals themselves, Babes in Arms, Follies, have proved the backdrops and some great excuses for musical numbers. Running neck and neck with Gypsy, undoubtedly the greatest musical ever about show business, is Dream Girls, Michael Bennett's masterpiece. Indeed, the musical motive, showbiz, it's just showbiz, weaves its way in and out of Dreamgirls the same way that Rose's I Had a Dream recur theme recurs in Gypsy, telling the story of the rise, fall, and rise of a group of black recording artists in the 1960s and 70s gave Michael Bennett a chance to use the Motown sound he loved growing up in Buffalo and the moves he absorbed working as a young dancer on the television show Hullabaloo. With the help of set designer Robin Wagner, he created an abstract, whirling, gliding canvas of playing area with four revolving towers where he could trans transform the action from onstage performance scene to an offstage turmoil through a quick shift in the brilliant lighting of Theron Muzzer. The opening of the show, certainly the most stunning sequence in, ben sequence in Bennett's career, begins with four women in hot pink, skin-tight dresses. Introduced as the, as the stepsisters, they began to sing, I'm looking for something. And the audience thinks, ah, there are the girls whose story we're going to follow. 
No, the real stars of the show soon enter, scarves on their heads, suitcases in hand, late for the talent contest at New York's Apollo Theatre. In a wonderful storytelling touch, when three our three girls finally get ready to perform, they're wearing exactly the same wigs as the stepsisters. During the next 15 minutes, we meet all the main characters of Dream Girls, learn about their ambitions, see the beginning of the relationship with that will ravel and unravel over the course of the upcoming two and a half hours, while all the time of the while all the time the show at the Apollo is continuing upstage, the contestants now playing to the back wall as we watch from backstage. After the dreams, when the dream uh, after the dreams, then the dreamettes lose the contest to Tiny Joe Dixon, all of six feet four. They prepare to get back on the bus to Chicago. The ambitious Curtis Taylor Jr., your Cadillac salesman, approaches them and offers them a job singing backup for the great headliner James Thunder Early. Read James Brown. From Curtis, whom Curtis doesn't even manage. All the time, the towers are still whirling. The vantage point is constantly shifting and now to the wings, now to the stage. In lesser hands, these shifts of focus would be chaos. But in the hands of Bennett, no doubt strongly abetted by collaborators Bomb Avian and Michael Peters, the audiences always, always knew where to look. Winding up this, the most smoothly delivered exposition ever. Laurel, the lovable Miss Adelaide of Dreamgirls, declares, Show business sure has a lot of ups and downs. And off they go. The tour with Jimmy Early. As we watch their wardrobe improve and their steps become slicker, as the stakes get higher, our leading lady, Effie, gets first shoved to the background and finally unceremoniously dumped from the show group altogether. This disintegration forms the basis of another brilliant Bennett sequence, Heavy, where every stage trick possible is employed, from lip syncing as the dream girls sing on television, Hallelujah, no, the fictional ABC star Cavill Cadet. Oh, <laughs> only to deteriorate into a shouting match among the girls as they pre as their pre-recorded vocals continue to play over them. To the fastest costume change ever, with the group marching upstage, still arguing as the curtain falls and bam, they break out into the miller in entirely new outfits, performing in a different location. One wonders how many hours of technical rehearsals it took Bennett, Theone Aldridge, the cast, dressers, and stage managers to get that six-second effect just right. The roar of shock from the audiences as Jennifer Holliday, Shelby Ralph, and Loretta Devine burst through, completely transformed and grinning from ear to ear, singing another verse of Heavy, a cruel, ironic lyric considering the girth of Evie's, Effie's character, about to be ousted from the group, must have been one of those moments creators of theater live for, and everything goes exactly right. Theone V. Aldridge Theone V. Aldridge, a costume designer who never met a sequin she didn't like, reached her pinnacle with three shows of the early 1980s. 42nd Street, in which the Ladies of Dames production number spilled onto the stage in a rainbow 1932 culture, Dream Girls, in which the rise of the pop group could be charted through their de ever deeper plunging necklines, and La Cage of Falls, uh, in which the pastel palette of the Saint Troops set was wildly offset by the spangles of a troop on drag queens. With a career dating back in 1959's Sweet Bird of Youth, she designed myriad shows set in every area, including Annie, Ballroom, I Remember Mama, Burnham, and The Rink. Her most iconic work, though, was the everyday dance attire for a chorus line. Everywhere color, fabric, and even size, she deliberately designed Kelly Bishop's leotard to be too small, adding to Sheila's complex combination of confidence and vulnerability, were used to further delineate character. Robin Wagner. Robin Wagner, who revolutionized Broadway for his whirling, spinning, gliding scenery, first turned heads with his urban designs for the musical Promises, Promises, and his first collaboration with Michael Bennett. He was a particular favorite of director choreographers like Bennett, Gower Champion, and Susan Stroman, helping them to create fluid, seamless transitions in shows such as Ballroom, For the Second Street, and Crazy for You. In addition to 
designing many rock musicals, Hair, Jesus Christ Superstar, and Inner City, his two masterpieces were on the 20th century, where he literally made an art deco train careen toward the audiences, and Dream Girls, in which his spinning towers became a giant game board for the brilliant staging of Bennett. Despite an artistic dry spell after Crazy For You, he has contributed fine work of late with the revival of Kiss Me Kate and the underrated moody ballroom unit set for The Wild Party. His award-winning design for the producers was a cannily constructed Broadway cliché, spoofing himself and totally in tune with the show's winking tone. Backstage. During casting of the original production, a young sister auditioned for the ensemble and, though her singing was extraordinary, her inadequate dancing skills caused Michael Bennett to reject her. Her name? Whitney Houston. The Drowsy Chaperone opened May 1st, 2006 at the Marquis Theatre with 674 performances. Produced by Kevin McCollum, Roy Miller, Boyd O Star Production, Stephanie McClelland, Barbara Freetag, and Jill Fermi. Book by Rob, Bob Martin and Don McKellar. Music and lyrics by Lisa Lambert and Greg Morrison. Musical director, Phil Reno. Music orchestrated by Larry Blank. Dance and incidental music arrangements by Glenn Kelly. Directed and choreographed by Casey Nicola. Scenic design by David Gallo. Costume design by Greg Barnes. Lighting design by Ken Billington and Brian Monahan. Monahan. Synopsis. The nameless man in chair, a borderline agoraphobe, Hold up in with his only collection of show albums to revel in, ignores his constantly ringing phone and addresses the audience directly, taking us on a trip down a fictional lane, memory lane by playing us the original cast recording of his favorite forgotten musical from 1928, The Drowsy Chaperone. As he, and we, watch from the sidelines, his dingy apartment turns into a fantastic pop-up book with Murphy beds folding down and cabinets open to reveal the elaborate sets and extravagant cast of the show winning within a show. And what a show it is. Cast. Adolfo. Danny Bernstein. Ber Bernstein. Mrs. Toddentail. Georgia Engel. Janet von der Graaf. Sutton Foster. Underling, Edward Hilberg, Hibbert, Robert Martin, Troy Britton Holston, Johnson, uh, George, Eddie Carbick, Gangster 2, Garth Kravitz, Gangster 1, Jason Kravitz, A Drowsy Chaperone, Beth Lebel, Trix, Keisha, Keisha Lewis Evans, Man in Chair, Bob Martin, Kitty, Jennifer Smith, Foldzig, Jenny Wolpe. A musical valentine for lovers and musicals, The Drowsy Chaperone is undoubtedly the only hit Broadway show ever to have started its life as a stag party entertainment. When Canadian writers Don McKellar, Lisa Lambert and Greg Morrison cooked up a Broadway musical spoof for the impending nuptials of their friends Bob Martin and Janine von der Graaf, whose names they lent to the central couple in their show within the show, the result was so successful that Martin came abroad as his co-writer and the foursome created the framing device of The Man in Chair. The Man in Chair, played originally by Martin himself, narrates three stories simultaneously. The highly complicated plot of The Drowsy Chaperone, a personal saga of which the characters playing in it, and finally, and only through vile references, his own personal story. The wonderful, amiable Martin strikes a chord with everyone who grew up listening to his or her parents' show albums in the family den. And then, and when he generally uses black velvet brush to clean the album he is about to play, he wins over every die-hard vinyl, collect vinyl collector in the house. Not only that those two groups are mutually exclusive by any means. Expanded for the Toronto Fridge Festival, the show was on a fairly quick track, development-wise, with an assist from up-and-coming directors Casey Nicola, who had made a splash with his choreography for the hit Spamalot, Chaperone, and had a success reading at the National Aliens or Musical Theatre Festival in the fall of 2004. It perceived as smart, quirky, and, keyword, producible enough to open on Broadway a year and a half later 
an almost unheard of schedule in today's treacherous producing climate. The show's score, while enjoyable, is made up of pastiches that, unlike the pastiches of Sandy Wilson's The Boyfriend or Stephen Sondheim's Follies, reveal their sketch comedy roots and aren't likely to go down as classics. The two songs that rise above, sheerly serviceable, are its black back-to-back showstoppers. In Show Off, the delightful Sutton Foster, who quickly becoming who is quickly becoming one of Broadway's most dependable young actresses, literally jumps through hoops as she demonstrates her versatile her versatile versatility and performing the quickest costume changes since dream girls all the while protesting too much that she wants to retire as we stumble along is a survival power ballad that mines the catalog of stiff upper lip anthems with a dash of look for the silver lining a pinch of you'll never walk alone and a sprinkle of i'm still here and a heavy dollop of lisa manelli at her lysest Playing the tipple, tippling title role under the 10 pounds of the eyeshadow, the sly Beth Level finally had a showcase for a triple threat talent. After 25 years of rising above flop material, the Civil War, and making something special out of supporting roles and hits, crazy for you, or doing her duty as a replacement, often better than the role's originator, a tapper of the first order, the, she was certainly the best ever Annie Amy any time Annie in 42nd Street. The rest of the cast, including such expert professors as Danny Bernstein, Georgia Engel, Lenny Wolp, and the hilariously unflappable Edward Hibbert, made the show one of its tightest ensemble in recent memory. While many current musicals are too willing to bite the hand that feeds them, opting for easy negative swipes at musical comedy with their smartest tone, the drowsy chaperone was the refreshing alternative, winking at the form with a nostalgic and loving eye. Sutton Foster with the girl next door looks of the young Mary Tuller Moore and the physical comedy skills and clarion belt of the young Carol Burnett, Sutton Foster is one of the most impressive young talents in their recent Broadway history, breaking up four leading roles in seven seasons. A tangle of arms, legs, and teeth, Foster joined the national tour of the Will Rogers Follies while still in high school. Not to worry, the Great White Way's newest sweetheart received her diploma via a correspondence course. After stints as Eponine in Le Mis and the star to be, they were right about that one, in Nell Carter, Revival of Annie, Foster was cast as the standby for the re- lead role in the pre Broadway production of Thoroughly Modern Millie. To quote a lyric from Applause, Foster got up early and pulled a Shirley MacLaine when she was tapped to replace the actress in the Tyler role, gave winning, uh, winning rave reviews and a Tony Award. Next, playing Jo March in the short-lived Little Women, she returned to the Marquis Theater, the site of her Millie triumph, to play somersaulting debutante Janet Von de Graaff in The Drowsy Chaperone. At this writing, she was about to jump into the role of the busty Ing, a great Roland Zihay with stage musical version of Young Frankenstein.